Hello and welcome back. If we just look at where we left off last time, we were in this situation, right, where we were rendering everything to the screen, but then rendering this IM GUI docking panel over top of it, which is blocking out our scene. And so we needed a way to actually render our scene onto a texture that we could then render within IM GUI. So today we're going to learn about frame buffers and how we can render everything to a frame buffer and then have that frame buffers texture rendered onto IM GUI. So to start, we'll create our frame buffers. Just so we have our mesh and shader, we'll have a frame buffer class. And as always, namespace hippo graphics frame buffer. Now, frame buffer needs to know about its own width and height so that we know what, what size of viewport we're rendering to. So let's we'll store that here as a float, uh, m width and m height. If you remember from our meshes and shaders, we have VAOs, VBOs, EBOs, all that sort of stuff. Uh, for frame buffers, we also have an ID. We'll call them FBOs. So let's go ahead and store that here. And I believe I used, if I go to mesh or shader.h. Yeah, un32 underscore t, so I'll do the same here. un32 underscore t mfbo. Now, the whole point of this frame buffer is that we get a texture, so we can render everything to a texture, and then we can render that texture elsewhere, for example, with an IM GUI. So we'll have a texture ID as well, un32 underscore t texture ID. Now, when we talk about a frame buffer, internally with an OpenGL, it, it consists of multiple frame buffers. And frame buffers are just how you handle data like depth and stencils and even uh, color, so color data. However, instead of a render buffer for our color, we're going to use a texture. We still need a render buffer for that depth and stencil side of things. So we're going to have a un32 underscore tm render buffer ID. And we're going to mesh them together so that the stencil and the depth are tracked within a single render buffer to save some memory. And then because frame buffer is something that you're rendered to on its own, instead of rendering to the window, you're rendering to this frame buffer, you also need a clear color. So we'll have our M clear color red, M clear color blue or green, M clear color blue, and M clear color alpha. And all these different floats make me really wish we had GLM already in the engine, so maybe that'll be next time. GLM is just a math library that, can, that has vectors that we can use instead of all these floats, but for now we'll keep it as is. Okay, so now with all of that data sort of defined, we can start defining our, our API. So frame buffer, uh, when we create a frame buffer, we need to pass in a width and a height. And actually, uh, width and height should be a UN32 underscore T because you can't have negative width or negative height. So we'll pass in UN32 underscore T width and UN32 underscore T height. And yes, I'll include C student. Good. Now our destructor, frame buffer, we'll clean ourselves up. And then we can just have a couple of sort of getters and setters here. Every All the work that we're going to need to do is going to be within our creation and destruction of the object. So we don't have a create and shutdown or initialize and shutdown method here. A frame buffer needs to persist until we're done with it. Um, so the concept of calling shutdown on a frame buffer and then have it still stick around doesn't really make sense. So we'll have this wrapped. Uh, RAII style, and then we'll just sort of get some stuff here. So like inline even 32 underscore t get FBO const return m FBO. Same with texture ID and render buffer ID. We might not need render buffer ID like at all, but we'll set it set it up anyways. And texture ID. Render buffer ID. Now we'll probably also want an in inline um, get size, and we'll have to pass in uh, un32 underscore t by reference width and un32 underscore t reference height, and then just width equals m width and uh, h equals m height. And then inline void, let's do a setting get for the clear color. So inline void set clear color float r float g float b float a 
clear color. Float reference red. Reference green. Float reference RGB and then float reference A. And then just the other way. So R equals MCCR. G equals MCCG. B equals MCCB. And A equals MCCA. This does indeed get a lot easier when we have GLM, so we'll clean this up next time. I think that's all we really need, so let's just go ahead and do the OpenGL work to create this frame buffer. So, include hippo graphics frame buffer, frame buffer .h, namespace hippo graphics. So our frame buffer construction constructor will take in this width and height and then we'll also just initialize like mfbo to zero and texture id to zero and render buffer id to zero and then maybe m c c r to uh, let's say white so one r g b a and then m, uh, i guess width and height should come first so so I'm width, uh, we're passing in width, so it's just use width, and then M height is height. And we are making OpenGL calls, so we'll need to include glad. And because we're making OpenGL calls, we'll want to include uh, hippo graphics helpers dot h, which has our check GL error method. Yeah. And we'll probably want to log as well, so include hippo log. I think that's all we want. So now we can actually start creating the frame buffer in OpenGL land. So just like the shaders, we'll call GL gen, and this time it's gen frame buffers. We're genning one frame buffer, and we want the ID to go to MFBO. And then we'll always do a hippo check GL error. And now we want to bind that frame buffer. So GL bind frame buffer. And the target will be GL underscore frame buffer. And the ID of the frame buffer is MFBO. I'll just keep that in my clipboard. So as I mentioned, the frame buffer consists of three underlying render buffers, right? And they're the color, the depth, and the stencil render buffer. Now, instead of our render buffer for color, we're gonna use a texture so that we can refer to it, pull it out, pass it into a shader, whatever we want. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a color texture. Let's create a texture, we go GL gen textures. We're genning one texture, the ID will go to M texture ID. And then we'll bind that texture. So GL bind texture. And we're binding target will be GL underscore texture underscore 2D. And we're binding M texture ID. And now we need to tell OpenGL the data that this texture is going to hold. So you go GL text image 2D. And again, it's whatever's in GL Texture 2D, which we just bound our texture to. So GL Texture 2D, the level is zero. And this is for mitmaps. Uh, we're not using mitmaps, so we can just leave that at zero. Now the internal format is how we're storing the data within OpenGL. So we're gonna go uh, GL underscore RGBA because we're supporting four different values for the color. That's what we wanna support here. Now the width, we know the width in pixels, so M width. The height, we know the height in pixels, and height border, according to the docs, it must be zero. So I don't know what the purpose of it is, but you have to pass in zero. And then for format, it's the pixel data. So even though we have the internal format of OpenGL, the pixel data itself might be reversed. It might come in from an external source that has them in out of order or like BGRA style. Um, so for us though, the texture data is going to be GL underscore RGBA. We're keeping everything the same because it's a color texture that is being rendered to from a frame buffer. So this will stay the same, GL RGBA. And the type of the data is the type of each R, G, B, and A component. And in our, per in our case, it'll be GL underscore unsigned underscore byte. And then pixels, this is actually a pointer to the actual data in memory. Now we don't have this and we it doesn't matter for us in, in the context of a frame buffer because when we render to the frame buffer, that's where our pixels are gonna come from. 
So we'll pass in null pointer, we'll have no data to start, but after we render the first time, we will have valid data within this texture. So that's all it takes to create a texture. So we're actually done with this one. We can unbind it with gl bind texture, gl texture to d, and pass in a zero. And now we need to tell OpenGL that this is the first component of our frame buffer. And you do that with a gl frame buffer texture 2d call. So your target is still gl frame buffer. And this is called an attachment. So we're passing in a gl atta uh, color attachment 0. And it's zero, as you can imagine, you have one, you can have up to 10, two, three. You can actually attach multiple color textures to a single frame buffer. For our purposes, we only want this to be a single color frame buffer, so GL color attachment zero. And the texture target is the target that we'll put in GL underscore texture underscore 2D. And the texture itself is M texture ID. And again, the level is zero. And I haven't been adding my hippo check error, so I'll do that there. And that's it. That's it for the color texture. We're done. So now we need to do that render buffer stuff I was telling you about with depth and stencil. So let's create our depth and stencil render buffer. Now I keep referring to them as a single thing because, again, with OpenGL, you can actually use a single render buffer and use 24 bytes for the depth and 8 bytes for the stencil. That way you can merge the two together. You lose a little bit of precision on the depth, for example, because you're not using a full 32, you're using 24 now but you rarely need that level of precision. And similarly, on the stencil side, you really usually don't need that high of precision because you're just sort of cutting things out when you're rendering them. So let's go ahead and do this now. So we'll go glgen render buffers. And you guessed it, it's one render buffer and the ID will go to m render buffer ID. And then gl bind render buffer, gl underscore render buffer, m render buffer ID. And now you need to tell OpenGL again what, what this render buffer is storing. So a gl render buffer storage, gl render buffer, and the internal format, just like RGBA, this time it'll be gl underscore depth 24 stencil 8, right here. So you're explicitly saying you want 24 bytes for depth and 8 bytes for stencil. And then again, it needs to width and height because just at the texture, it needs to know how big we're talking about. So m width, m height. And that's it for that call. So just like the texture, we unbind, gl bind, render buffer, gl render buffer, zero. And then we tell OpenGL that we want this to be the, the depth stencil attachment. So gl frame buffer, render buffer, just like gl frame buffer texture 2D. We'll go gl frame buffer. And for the attachment, it's gl depth stencil attachment. So it supports this already. Now the render buffer target is gl render buffer. And the render buffer is and render buffer ID. And that's all there is to it. It's really not too bad. And now what we can do, just like the shader, how we compiled and linked it before we said, okay, we're good. We need to check for what's called completeness. So check for completeness. So GL check frame buffer status with GL underscore frame buffer. And this will return an in32 underscore T called, we'll call it complete status. Now we can check against it. So if complete status is not equal, gl underscore frame buffer underscore complete, then we know we have a problem. So hippo error, failure to create frame buffer. Complete status is complete status. So we can at least error out, and then we can just, regardless of whether success succeeded or not, we can just bind frame buffer, gl frame buffer, zero. Okay, so there's our code for setting up a frame buffer. Now, uh, frame buffer, destructor, we just gl delete frame buffers. We're deleting one frame buffer and the ID is mfbo. And then we'll just reset our value. So mfbo equals zero, m texture ID equals zero, and render buffer ID equals zero. And that's all there is to it. So again, all of this stuff just comes from their docs, so it's pretty easy to follow once you once you sort of take a read through. But now that we've got it all here, and yeah, I guess I should do that, even though that I'm sure this will never fail with the zero, but 
Um, now we can actually start creating these frame buffers and using them. So if we go to our window.cpp for a second, um, this is what's actually executing all the renders, right? Like we call begin render on this and then end render on this. So in OpenGL, when you don't bind to a frame buffer explicitly, you're currently bound to the default frame buffer. And that frame buffer is just gonna print the stuff, print whatever you're rendering onto the screen. So it doesn't give you the option of getting sort of a texture out, out of that so you can render it elsewhere, right? It's just, that's what the default frame buffer does. So what we should do is have the window have its own frame buffer and that way we're always rendering to a texture. And then we can choose to render that texture to the screen if we'd like, or we can use it with IAM GUI. So let's go to our header and this should have a frame buffer. So std shared pointer to a graphics frame buffer and frame buffer. And now, yep, we should uh, just forward declare this thing. So namespace hippo graphics class frame buffer. And we'll need memory as well. Perfect. Okay, should be good. Uh, now, one more thing we need to do on the window side is when we initialize this, we need to set attribute for SDL GL stencil size to be eight bytes here. Now, when it comes to frame buffers, because we're supporting the concept of rendering off screen, that's what this means, right? So the default frame buffer, this is your screen with your little title bar X. Uh, the default frame buffer will render here to the screen. But if we do an, what's called an off screen render to a frame buffer, we now have this sort of in let's say texture one, right? Now it's possible that I, while I'm rendering to texture one, I also want to render to texture two and then render texture two back onto texture one somewhere, right? Um, there's this concept of a stack here where I might render something to this texture while I'm rendering that, or even after I wanna render something else, right? Text two. And then I want to like run these through a shader to give me a texture three, which I then go back and render manually to the screen. So there's a concept here of attaching a frame buffer and then halfway through that render, I wanna render this thing. So attaching that one now, render everything. Then I pop it. So I'm rendering back on this frame buffer. Then I finish my rendering and then I can pop that and then render here. So somebody needs to be aware of the stack and needs to manage it. Additionally, because we are using deferred rendering, we can't just drop these bind and unbind frame buffer calls like anywhere within our code. We actually need, they need to be render commands. So let's go to render commands and add a new command for pushing and popping a frame buffer. So I have a class frame buffer. Let's say push frame buffer. And for private, we'll have a std weak pointer to a frame buffer. And then push frame buffer, we'll pass in a std weak pointer to a frame buffer. And these actually should be overrides. Not every compiler wants you to have them, but we should. Just to be safe. So execute override and um, and then for and then pop frame buffer this one doesn't actually really need to be passed anything in because we're just popping whatever's on top of the stack and we'll just take this pop it in. okay so let's switch over to cpp void push frame buffer execute we'll do the same thing so std shared pointer to a frame buffer let's just say fb we'll set frame buffer dot lock and if fb else attempting to execute push frame buffer with valid data and we'll need to know what frame buffer is 
then we'll have a pop frame buffer that actually just pops something. So keep talking about this frame buffer stack. We should probably store that within the render manager. So render manager has a queue of render commands. It should also have a stack of frame buffers. So we can do is to stack, and we'll need to include stack. Stack. Okay, and we'll get a stack of std. These are going to be shared pointers to graphics frame buffer and frame buffers. And now nobody should be able to push and pop frame buffers directly against the render manager. It must be through a render command. Otherwise, the ordering is going to get all messed up because it's all deferred. So we're going to make private methods. Void push frame buffer. Poster share pointer of graphics. Frame buffer, frame buffer, and then avoid pop frame buffer. And now, if we just create these method implementations, so simply we'll just do m frame buffers dot push frame buffer, so it's on our stack, and we'll actually tell OpenGL to bind it. So GL bind frame buffer, and GL frame buffer. And frame buffer dash arrow get FBO. And this will need to know what a frame buffer is, so there we go. And now that we've bound that frame buffer, we need to clear the color and depth, just like we do up here with the with the regular clear command. So first we need that clear color out of the frame buffer, and I think we just passed in a bunch of floats. So let's say RGBA and then Frame buffer that sure get clear color. Yeah, so RGBA passing by reference. And then we can call GL clear color RGBA and then GL clear. Actually we're just gonna do this. And good idea. Let's put this in here just in case. And there, so now that, as soon as we bind the frame buffer, we clear it so that we can render to it fresh, and then we're good to go. And then when we pop a frame buffer. First, we want to make sure that we're popping something that is there. So let's assert that m frame buffers dot size is greater than zero. Otherwise, um, let's just say uh, render manager pop frame buffer empty stack. Now, if m frame buffers dot size is greater than zero, m frame buffers dot pop. That's all you have to call. Now, when we pop a frame buffer. We're, we, we haven't unbound it or anything like that, right? So we need to know what are we binding now. So once we've popped it, we need to see what's next in the stack and either bind that or bind to nothing so that we're, we're back on the default frame buffer. So if m frame buffers dot size is still greater than zero, that means there's something on the stack that we should bind back to. So let's just get that. So auto uh, next frame buffer equals m frame buffers dot top whatever's on top of the stack and then we can just call gl bind frame buffer gl frame buffer next fb dash arrow get fbo okay and then else we don't have anything to bind to so we'll bind to zero okay so now push and pop are done if we go back to render commands cdp this we'll want to call and we have Oh, we don't have the engine, so blue hippo slash engine.h. So we can get the render manager out. Engine instance dot get render manager dot push frame buffer. We'll pass in FB. And then here we'll pop frame buffer. Now I did mention that I wanted them to be private, so obviously we can't call them from here unless we go to render manager dot h and make them friend classes. So we can say friend class, render commands, push frame buffer, and render commands, pop frame buffer. And yeah, this should be graphics, render commands, push and pop. So now push and pop have access to everything that's private within render manager, and only push and pop have access to everything that's private. So I still can't ask the engine for the render manager and call push frame buffer on it. That's still not going to be allowed. But this way, the render commands can do that. So we can still adhere to our deferred rendering pipeline.
So if we go back to window.h, we did create a frame buffer here. We just never did anything with it. So let's set it up now. So when we create the window, we have the window, we open, set up OpenGL, set up the clear color, and set up a Maya GUI window. So maybe just above that, we'll also create our frame buffer. So M frame buffer equals to make shared graphics frame buffer. And we'll pass in uh, the width and height, right? So props.width and props.height. Do I have frame buffer? I don't. There we go. And then we can just, uh, because this is our, our window frame buffer, we can pass in that clear color. So M frame buffer dash arrow set clear color. And we'll just basically do this. We don't even need to call this anymore because uh, we're rendering, Windows gonna be rendering to a frame buffer. So we'll just set it on the frame buffer instead. And now in the begin and end render, we wanna push and pop our frame buffer here. So we're gonna clear like normal and then we're gonna queue up a render command to push our frame buffer. So first I need that auto, let's just say CMD for command, equals std, make unique graphics, render commands, push frame buffer, oops, push frame buffer, and we'll pass in M frame buffer. And now we can say engine instance, get render manager, submit, and we'll submit std, move, CMD. And this is actually, very verbose because uh, we have to make a unique pointer every time we have to pass the render command in every time and then all of the parameters that it takes so we can actually condense this um, with a macro and I think I want to do that so maybe in render manager .h, we can just define macro so define uh, we'll say hippo submit render command and we'll just take in a type and then all the arguments that it needs Right, and this will just expand to std move, std make unique. Right, if we do it all in one line, we can do it this way. Uh, hippo, graphics, render commands, and then type. So by writing type in here, we're going to use whatever they've passed in. And then we'll pass in underscore underscore va underscore args underscore underscore, just like our log methods. And this is going to make it a lot cleaner, actually, because we still have to move a unique pointer, but now it's all going to be hidden behind this, behind this macro. And I know some people are not really fans of macros. I don't mind them. Um, so let's go back here and we can just remove all that. And we can just say this. So we're using render manager twice. So auto reference RM equals engine instance get render manager. And we'll say RM.clear and RM.submit. We'll say hippo submit RC. We're submitting a push frame buffer and we're passing in M frame buffer. There, that's much cleaner. And then for end render, we probably want to do something similar. So we'll get the render manager, we'll submit a pop frame buffer, which doesn't take any parameters. And then we, I guess we're going to need to flush it just in case, like now we want to render to the actual screen, right? Um, so let's do an rm.flush which will unbind our frame buffer from this. And that should be good. And now the other thing to talk about is what's called a viewport. So when we run our app, we have our window, it's of a certain size. OpenGL by default creates our viewport of the same size. And that's why when we resize the screen, we can't render outside of that small square that we had at the start. It's because our viewport isn't being resized on the OpenGL side. So we need to be able to resize our viewport every time we switch frame buffers because frame buffers will be of different sizes. So we need OpenGL to update itself so it's always gonna be rendering within the correct viewport. And a viewport, we just give it a left and a top, which will be zeros and then the width and height, and that's it. Um, so let's go to our render manager, .h, and we'll expose um, maybe a set viewport. Float x, float y, float width, float height. And then just above, set clear color. And we'll just call it GL viewport x, y, width, height. When we push a frame buffer here, we need to uh, call set viewport 
with the new dimension. So uh, frame buffer dash arrow get. Oh, actually, I think frame buffer does this width and height, and then frame buffer dash arrow get size width and height, and then we can pass it in along here. So now if our frame buffer goes from 100 by 100 to 200 by 200, uh, we're going to ensure that we update our viewport so that OpenGL's render calls will actually go into the 200s there. So let's just copy that. We clear everything and then down here, uh, when we bind the next frame buffer, we need to do it again for the new frame buffer. Right? And then for this case, we want to set the viewport back to the window size. So we need to get that window size. Um, auto reference window equals engine instance get window and then set viewport zero zero oh actually I think the window does the same thing doesn't it window dot get size and then width and height and then width and height there we go we don't have engine here And these are ints, not UN32s. It probably should be UN32s, but that's all right. Um, there we go. So now our viewport will always be sort of updated to the, the correct size, depending on the frame buffer or the screen. And I think that's it. I think that's all we need to do. So maybe um, I should add these here for bind. I'm pretty sure that's fine. And yeah, so we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. Once we can run it, um, conversion to float from float to jealous. Um, yes, okay, so viewport is actually integer, so we used to uh, un32 underscore. Actually, I think x and y can be negative, so let's just get int x, int y, int width, int height. Is that okay now? I think our frame buffer size were ints as well because they can't be float, so we should be good. Now we're here and you can see that we're not actually rendering anything to the screen anymore. Remember, we used to be able to see this sort of see through at the beginning of this video. Uh, we're not seeing it anymore because we're no longer rendering to the default frame buffer. You see, there are no issues, so we are rendering to something uh, and it's not the default frame buffer, so you don't see it there. So now we should actually have a, a texture. We should be rendering to a texture that we can expose here in IAM GUI. So let's go ahead and do that now. Our main.cpp can actually define a, a panel. Uh, I usually call these panels. We can define a panel just for the view into the game, right? And so if we do that, if we do an if IAM GUI begin, let's say game view, and then IAM GUI end, we can do an IAM GUI image, right? And now this IAM texture ID is just a void star. It maps to whatever backend you're using and what, however they define what a texture is. So we actually need to get that from our window, so window.h. And uh, let's just expose here, so an inline, and actually these can all be inline. So we want our graphics frame buffer. Uh, let's do a pointer since we're forward declaring, right? Yep. So we'll do a raw pointer and we'll just get what's behind that shared pointer. So frame buffer star get frame buffer. We'll just return m frame buffer dot get. I don't want to return a shared pointer itself because you know I don't want the client app to be able to hold on to it. Um, so I'll just return a raw pointer. And now back to main.cpp. Um, we can actually ask for the window here. So auto reference window equals engine instance get window so you can see here so it takes that IAM texture ID which is just a pointer to our actual ID depending on the backend we're using so let's cast a void star and then uh, window dot get frame buffer dash arrow get texture ID right this is where we're rendering our color buffer to so this is what we want to expose here well, I don't know what a frame buffer is so let's go to frame buffer There we go, that's good. And then we need a size. Um, so you can see it's an imvec2. This is sort of their internal way of storing two floats. So we can define an imvec2. We can actually just initialize it with an initializer list. And we'll give it a size. So let's just say 100 by 100. And this will be the size that it shows up as in imgui. So 
I think that's all we need. Let's run it. And hopefully we see just a new window with a very tiny viewport in it. Oh, and they're getting a warning here. Uh, converting a UN32 star to void star of greater size. Oh yeah, I've done done this before. So pointer is 64 bits and we're only giving an int of 32. Um, so you can just cast it. We actually have a way to cast this. Int pointer underscore t. So we'll cast the UN32 underscore t to an int pointer underscore t, which makes it a safe int pointer. And this, this end pointer is not always 64, it just depends on what your system is, so in our case it is 64, and that's what will allow it to cast to a void star safely. So let's run this now. And there's a game view, and it's fully black. And we're not getting any errors from here, so why is it black? So let's go to our frame buffer.cpp, and so it looks fine. Um, maybe get the texture because the texture it's going to be sort of resized when we put it on IM GUI. Like we're st we're only printing it on a, like the IM GUI image size is only 100 by 100. So maybe we just have to set up the texture parameters for how to stretch that image. Like I thought they were defaulting to something valid, but let's just try it and see if that fixes it because it might have to do with that resizing piece. So to set these uh, values for what happens when the texture is smaller or larger than what it was rendered to, um, you need to basically tell it if it should be linearly interpolate between the two or if it should just go to the nearest pixel. And you might have heard of this before, you usually want nearest for like pixel art and you want linear for something a little more high res. Because this is a frame buffer that we're rendering to, um, we could probably just set them as linear for now and just maybe we expose a way to set it later if we need to uh, so that the caller can pass in a width, the height, and a, a, a filter format. Uh, but either way, let's just go with linear for now. So the way you do this is with GL text parameter i. So you're setting a texture parameter that is an integer of whatever is in GL texture 2D. And the name of the parameter we're setting is GL texture min filter. And we're gonna give it GL linear. Okay, that's all there is to it. And then we'll do the same for the mag. So if we're rendering this on something that's larger uh, than what, what we expected it to be, it'll again linearly interpolate between the two and figure it out. Um, so yeah, let's just see if that fixes it because that's the only thing I can think of that I haven't defined. I thought there was a sensible default, but hey, there we go. Uh, okay, so I guess there's no sensible default here, eh? That's interesting. Um, but thankfully we figured that one out pretty quickly. Um, now, what you can see is we've lost the ability to move the color with our mouse, right? I can still use keyboard and I can still use this, but I can't use my mouse position anymore. Actually, I guess, so if I just go off the edge of the screen here, it looks like I am GUI is, is, is allowing, at least for one frame, that uh, mouse to go into our app. But this has happened because we explicitly said, like if I am GUI wants to use the mouse, we shouldn't update our mouse uh, data for our game to use. So obviously for something like game view, if this is the view into a game, we want our mouse to work in here. So we can do that fairly quickly in main.cpp. So while we're in here, we can actually simply say, if I'm GUI is window hovered, and if, so that's saying if the window I'm currently in is hovered, um, then we can actually tell iMGUI not to capture the mouse here. So iMGUI capture mouse from app false. So now we're telling iMGUI not to capture the mouse so that we can keep updating our mouse structure on the engine side. And now if I run this, yeah, you can see the mouse works in this top left, top right corner, but not over here. Now, if you notice, um, down and up are actually inverted, right? It's supposed to get closer to white as I go up or closer to green as I go up. And the reason that it does that is because I'm GUI just renders everything upside down, <laughs> basically. Um, so very quickly, um, we pass in a size. We also can pass this UV zero and UV one. And this is telling I'm GUI how to map the texture coordinates into its image that it's rendering. So if we just, uh, maybe we'll do it. I am vec two size. Equals 100 by 100. I am vec2 
uh, uv0. So this is the uh, x. So we go from 0 to 1, meaning left to right. And then I am vec2, uv1. We'll set it to 1, 0. So we're basically just telling it to invert the y position. So we'd say, uh, instead of part coding in here, we'll just say size, uv0, uv1. Okay, let's give that a shot. And now you can see that it did properly flip it on the y-axis, but it left the x-axis correct. And you can see we can't ever quite reach that really thick, that really dark area, because our mouse, in this case, is on the top right of our screen. If we were to drag this down here, you can see we can really get into the blue now. Um, so that's uh, something else we're going to have to fix. Maybe not for this video, but we will have to map our mouse position to this image so that we can actually override the, the mouse position that SDL is telling us to use because SDL will tell us the mouse position between the entire screen. We want the mouse position within the game view for our game to actually reference, right? Uh, so this should be 0, 0, and this should be 100 by 600. And we can interpolate between the two. But that's for another day. I think for now, we have a very cool uh, little docking engine here. So maybe we'll do something like this. Let me even put this one on this side. Put this one down here. Um, it's a little bigger. And there we go. We have something that actually looks like a <laughs> could be an editor at some point. Let's just uh, go up and make this bigger. So let's just go. Uh, we can't go 800 by 600. Let's go um, 480 by 320. Just so it's at least a little bigger. There we go. That's better. Now I can move this position. And actually, I called it rect position. It's not the rect position. It's actually just the color <laughs> offset. But um, yeah, there we go. Now we have something that actually works. We're now rendering to a frame buffer and then rendering that texture through IM GUI. So um, I think at some point we'll want this to sort of uh, resize itself with the I'm GUI panel like here I can cover up half of it um, here I see too much dark like really this should be centered in this panel and resized to fit basically um, and if you saw that first video where I did the little engine showcase you see that that, that is something that I have done uh, so we can definitely do that at some point in the future uh, maybe at the same time while we map the X position so that this is zero zero and this is a hundred by six hundred and actually on that point it doesn't have to be a hundred by six hundred right now that we are rendering to a frame buffer the frame buffer can be whatever size we want it to be, even though it's going to be minimized or mag magnified into a bigger or smaller space, we can actually have our render buffer be any size we want. And that helps when it comes to things like creating assets. Let's say we're creating, we're assuming everything is going to be 1920 by 1080. All of our assets can be set up so that they look good at that resolution. And that could also be this frame buffer size of our game. And then depending on the window size, when we actually have a game and not an editor, uh, we can do the same thing we're going to do in this panel where we center it on the screen and resize it to fit and all of that good stuff. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself for now. This is a great place to end the video. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.